from the betting capital of the world. Giving raw and real breakdowns of mixed martial arts and recapping UFC events like no one else with producer Martin on the ones and twos and combat sports betting expert Effie. You're listening to Any Action Sportscast. Any Action Sportscast. So put your headphones on and let's take this podcast to the next level. Um, this isn't a podcast. It's a sportscast. What's up, guys? We are back. It's your boy Effie with Any Action Sportscast here to go over UFC Vegas 80. Grant Dawson versus Bobby Green. We are back after taking a week off with no UFC fights. We had to resort to watching college football, NFL. We actually bet on the Canelo fight. But we're back, man. We're back with 10 fights at the UFC Apex. It should be a good card, man. For a fight night card, there's a lot of good fights. A lot of wide minus 400 favorites, but a lot of you know closely lined fights as well. So we're going to have to be choosing our spots here carefully, but I'm actually really excited for this fight night card. Even the women's MMA fights should be good fights. But yeah, man, do me a favor, hit that like button, hit that subscribe button, um, and let's get right into the fights. In the very first fight of the night, we have a women's flyweight fight between Montana De La Rosa and JJ Aldrich. The line currently sits Montella De La Rosa at minus 130 and JJ Aldrich at plus 110. Now, earlier in the week, Montella De La Rosa was actually the underdog. She was plus 120, plus 115, and money's been coming in on her, pushing her to minus 130. On the screen right here, you can see on Monday, she was minus 110. Pick them both ways. And yeah, man, I'm actually going to agree with that line movement. I am picking Montella De La Rosa to win this fight via decision. And the way I see this fight playing out, man, I really don't see any finishing ability or threat here from J.J. Aldridge. J.J. Aldridge will be the better striker in this fight. She will have the hand speed in this fight and the more sophisticated striking in this fight. But Montella De La Rosa 100% has the grappling advantage in this fight as well, man. And I think that her grappling advantage is more significant here than J.J.'s stand-up uh, advantage over De La Rosa in this fight. I think that J.J. Aldrich, you know, has been taken down um, previously in the UFC and has kind of shown a blueprint of how to beat her. Um, and also, man, her physique isn't the best. I know, you know, MMA is not like a bodybuilding contest. It's just about your skills. But if you were to see J.J. Aldrich on the scale, you wouldn't think that she's a pro, you know, athlete. Whereas Montana De La Rosa, man, she's going to be able to get her down and really control her. So if anything, I think a finish... If a finish does happen in this fight, it's going to be from Montella De La Rosa somehow on the mat, whether it be a submission or a uh, ground and pound finish. But I actually do think that Montella De La Rosa is going to win this fight via accumulating a lot of control time and getting easy takedowns on J.J. Aldridge. I wouldn't be surprised to see a lot of this fight being taking place along the cage in the clinch. But ultimately, I do expect Montella De La Rosa to be able to take down J.J. Aldridge and win a decision in this fight. Up next, another women's MMA fight. Back-to-back -back women's MMA fights to start the night. We have Kanako Murata taking on Vanessa Demopoulos in the women's strawweight division. Um, and this line is crazy, man. Uh, super interesting matchup here. But again, I am going to go with the wrestler in this fight, which is Kanako Murata here. So Murata, you know, she's taking a huge layoff. She lost her last most recent fight against Verna Janjaroba via armbar, where she actually got her arm snapped and broken in that fight. So... That's not a good look, uh, but Verena has really, really good jiu-jitsu. Um, and Murata is a very top-heavy, top-control type fighter with her wrestling, and she got armbarred. So she snapped her arm, took a long layoff, two years, hasn't fought in two years, and this is her return fight. And she comes in as a massive minus 300 favorite. Just crazy, man. Hasn't fought in two years coming in at minus 300. Pretty, pretty insane. But the thing is, she's fighting Vanessa Demopoulos, man. Vanessa Demopoulos is 9-5 in her pro career, uh, UFC career, or pro MMA career, I should say. She's plus 240 on the money line. She's 35 years old, man. 5'2 with a 59 and a half inch reach. So she will be an inch taller than uh, Murata in this fight with a shorter reach. And the thing that Vanessa likes to do, man, she likes to go for her submissions off her back. And I don't think that's going to be able to happen here against Murata. On the feet, I really don't like Vanessa's striking. Murata's striking is not, you know, anything to write home about either, but... I, I'm really down on Demopolis as a fighter, especially her stand-up. I mean, she's 9-5 as a pro. I kind of don't understand how she's in the UFC. Um, not for nothing, she used to be a stripper before being an MMA fighter, so you know she has some pretty tight uh, thighs, some pretty good clinches with her thighs. Um, and she's built, man. She's short and stocky and pretty pretty yoked. So I'm going to be interested to see how she defends these takedowns from Murata, but man, she got ragdolled in her last fight against Carolina Kolbakevich, who's also 
uh, on this card as well. And Carolina's a striker, man. So she was getting out wrestled by someone who was super old and a striker. And now she's fighting an Olympic wrestler or Olympic level wrestler, I have to say, in uh, Kanako Murata here. So I think the takedowns will come easily again in this fight, similar to the last one. And I think that Murata will win a decision in this fight. I don't foresee her finishing Vanessa because Vanessa has good uh, jujitsu. She's a black belt. And she's going to be squirming off her back, man. She's going to be fishing for those arm triangles, those arm bars off her back. But I don't think it happens, man. She's 35 years old, fainting her big time in this fight. I'm not going to be parlaying Murata, I'll be honest. I don't um, like parlaying minus 300 women's MMA favorites if, unless I know they're going to finish the opponent you know, super early. But... The thing that Murata is good at is her wrestling, and the thing that Demopolis is good at is her jiu-jitsu, so it's kind of weird. Demopolis is going to be okay in the area where Murata is probably her best at, so uh, that's never good. Demopolis too comfortable off her back. Give me Murata to win via decision. And up next, we have a flyweight fight between Nate Maness and Matuas Mendonca. Maness comes in with a 14 and 3 record, currently sitting as a plus 220 underdog. He is 32 years old, 5'10 with a 72 inch reach. Matuas comes in 10 and 1, suffering his first pro career loss in his most recent fight. He is coming in as a favorite at minus 270. He is 24 years old, 5'6 with a 71 inch reach. So the tail of the tape is actually kind of crazy in this fight. And for one, I gotta mention how this is that flyweight, man. Both fighters are going down. Um Matuas Mendonca is a bantamweight. Nate Maness, you know, has been fighting at flyweight where he shouldn't be fighting at flyweight, man. He is 5'10", weighing in at 125, man. You see, you should see this guy on the scale. This dude looks like a skeleton, man. It's pretty insane. At 5'10", man, I just don't think your brain is, is going to be as healthy as it should be weighing 125. I mean, I get it. He only has to weigh that for a little bit while he's on the scale. But, man, that's just a tough, tough weight cut. And as far as the fight goes, as far as the skill set plays out, I've been impressed with Matuas Mendonca. I know he's super young in this fight. He's only 24 years old. But he's out of a very good gym, man. He's at a shooter box in Brazil. Man, he's training guys with... Uh, he's training with killers like uh, Charles Oliveira, you know, Wilcat Santos, uh, Elvis Brenner. Like, those guys are savages. And the thing is with the shooter box guys, the way they fight is they just go forward, man. And this obvious in Matuas, man. Matuas loves to go forward. Um, he did jump Gilly a couple times against Javi Basharat, which was a bad idea. Bashra is a good fighter, man. He lost his debut against Javi Bashra, who, in my opinion, is a, a killer. He would kill uh, Nate Maness in this fight. Um, and Matuas throws heavy, man. He has heavy leg kicks. Uh, he can go to the body, which I really like. Really heavy body kicks. Um, he can go low and high with his kicks very quick. And he has a heavy, heavy right hand. And I actually think that he's going to catch Nate Maness with that right hand and put him down at some point in this fight. I don't know if he's going to finish him in this fight, but I am going to go with uh, Matuas Mendonca knockout in the second round. Nate Maness, man, he's on a two-fight losing streak, which is kind of funny that he lost to uh, Umar Namagomedov, and then they gave him to Gear Unumbekov. So Umar Namagomedov, you know, that's no shame in that fight, man. He's a beast. He's a future champion. He's Habib's cousin who's undefeated. So I'm figuring the UFC was, were kind of surprised that he took that fight, and then they didn't do him any favors and gave him to Gear Unumbekov the very next fight, who is also Khabib's you know, teammate in that gym. I don't know if he's his cousin or anything, but another Russian in that fight, he lost in the first round via submission. So... Um, those two fighters, I mean, not for nothing, Nate, those, those are good fighters. Like, that's not really that bad of a look if you're Nate Maness, but, um, in that Tony Gravely fight before that, man, he almost got knocked out, sent to the shadow realm, and that first round came back and won it in the second, uh, finished Tony Gravely there. That was a good fight. You know, this guy has heart, so, you know, makes me wonder, does Matuas have enough to finish him? Um, but I wouldn't be shocked to see Nate Maness on his back get dropped in this fight. So, give me Matuas Mendoka via knockout and to cover his minus 270 price tag. I'm gonna go, ultimately, with a second round knockout. And up next, we have another women's MMA fight. Um, should be another interesting matchup, man. I'm actually really excited for, to see this one play out um, for a number of reasons. We have a women's strawweight fight between Carolina Kolvakiewicz and Diana Belbita. Kolvakiewicz comes in with a 15-7 and record on a three-fight winning streak, sitting as a minus 190 favorite. She is 37 years old, big red flag there, 5'3", with a 64-inch reach. Now, Deanna Belbita comes in also with an identical 15-7 and record, sitting as a plus-165 underdog, 27 years old, 5'7", with a 68-inch reach. And I'm going with the underdog in this fight. I'm going with Deanna Belbita to win this fight. So I want to start, uh, before we get into Deanna, I want to talk about Carolina Kovacavich. So Kovacavich, you know, 
found herself in a weird spot where she was on this crazy long losing streak, but it was against all really good fighters, man. Jessica Andrade, Michelle Waterson, Alexa Grasso, Jan Janan, Jessica Panay. I mean, the Panay one was probably not that good of a loss, but I mean, all the other ones, man, those are killers. Lost to Claudia Gudelia, uh, lost to Joanna Jacek. And so she ended up taking a huge break and not really fighting for a long time. And then when she came back in her most recent run, she is 3-0 with three wins where she's really utilizing her wrestling, man. She's been a striker for the most part of her career. And now all of a sudden, she's really turning into a wrestler, really um, getting a lot of control time in these fights. And we talked about Vanessa Demopoulos re uh, recently. And she mauled her, man. She dominated her, uh, took her down at will, kind of. And then against, who was it? Felice Herring, man. She got that submission. And that was a big one because she took a year off in between those fights. And she was dealing with a lot of mental stuff. Um, she was talking about suicide and, and, and stuff like that. So she came out and got that submission win. So... She let out like a crazy scream after she got that submission. It was it was pretty crazy, man. Pretty primal. Um, and she's on a good run, man. At this age in her career, to have a three fight winning streak is pretty wild. And like I said, man, a striker that's using her wrestling to get those wins. But she's fighting Diana Belbita, who I'll be honest, isn't that good of a fighter in my opinion. She is not a specialist anywhere. She's pretty average in every single area. I mean, she's not bad. She's not like she's bad at striking or bad at wrestling. Like she's pretty decent everywhere. But she doesn't really uh, specialize in one single you know attribute. You could say. Um, but the thing that I, makes me like her in this fight is clearly the 10-year age gap. Right away, she's 27 years old. Carolina Kovacavich is 37 years old, approaching 38 years old. She'll be 38 in a month, or actually a week. Um, and she also has a size advantage, man. She's going to be 4 inches taller than Kovacavich in this fight, and she'll have a 4-inch reach advantage in this fight. So if Carolina Kovacavich can get inside and get inside those hips of Belbita and get her down, and this turns into a 50-minute striking fight, I know she's a sophisticated striker, probably... Uh, the better striker, honestly, with more experience. I'm gonna go with Diana Belbita to win this fight. I really like that age. I really like that. The, I really like that size advantage, man. I think that those intangibles are gonna play a factor in this fight. I know Carolina is on a three-fight, you know, winning streak here. Um, she's looking good doing it, but give me Diana Belbita to win as a underdog at plus 165. I think that she's gonna win a decision in this fight. Carolina is gonna be able to. Or she's going to be struggling to get this fight down. And it's going to turn into a point fight. Give me Diana Belvita to win a decision. Zip real quick. You guys like my thing? Let me know in the comments. It keeps my beer warm. <laughs> oh, man. Up next is a banger. Of, are we on the main card yet? Uh, I'm not sure. I don't think so. But this is a, uh, I think it's a feature prelim. Yeah. Um, the last prelim. We have a banger of a fight for as long as it lasts. This should be um, an open and shut case. We should find out who's going to win this fight fairly quickly. We have a light heavyweight fight between Philip Linz and Ion Kunta Laba. Philip Linz comes in 17 and 5 as a plus 125 underdog. He is 38 years old, big red flag, 6 2 with the 78 inch reach. He's fighting Ion the whole Kunta Laba. Kuntalaba is 17-9-1, coming in is at minus 150, 29 years old, 6-1 with a 75-inch reach. Now, this line flipped. Philip Lins opened as a favorite and got bet down to an underdog. So money's been coming in on Kuntalaba, so there's people out there with plus money tickets on Kuntalaba. And at minus 150, I will not be betting on Kutalaba. This dude has proven to be super untrustworthy in the UFC. At minus 150, you're paying, you know, juice on a guy who, for one, is chinny. Two, can be finished at will. And three, if he doesn't finish it early, he's probably not going to win the fight at all. He's fighting Philip Linz, who I get it, is 38 years old. But in my opinion, is the better sophisticated fighter Overall, in MMA, then Ian Kutalaba. Philip Linz won the million dollars in PFL um, and then started getting drug tested, and his physique changed like crazy. He came in and sucked it up in the UFC. Now, recently, he's bounced back, um, went back down a lot heavyweight, um, and he's on a three-fight winning streak now where he has looked better, and he's, he has been able to extend fights and not get finished early. Um, we have seen his chin checked a little uh, in his career as well. But Ian Kutalaba, to me, is just someone that's, a little untrustworthy at minus 150 to be betting on, man. But the thing with this fight is I actually do favor Ayan Kutalaba to catch Philip Linz and knock him out in the very first round. And one factor that I think is going to play a big you know, point in this fight is the apex, man. If this was in a regular pay-per-view size cage, 
Philip Lins would have way more room to operate and, and way more room and area to survive that first round wave from Ayan Kutalaba. Ayan Kutalaba is going to look his best in that first round. Once that first round ends, he's going to look bad. He's going to look worse in the second round. He's going to look even worse in the third round. So Philip Lins, all he has to do is survive and not get finished in that very first round. And he should be able to finish Ayan Kutalaba himself. But I think that the 29-year-old young Ayan Kutalaba is going to be able to cut off the cage in the short Apex Octagon and press Philip Lins along the cage on the warning track and then catch him. If Ayan Kutalaba takes Philip Lins down early in this fight, Philip Lins, Philip Lins might not be able to get up. I know he's a black belt in jiu-jitsu, but he, his get-ups aren't that good. He's just more of a, survi a survivor on the ground. And man, it's funny saying that because Ayan Kutalaba got choked out by Johnny Walker. Johnny Walker, uh, I don't think I've ever seen him submit anybody, man. That, that was crazy, man. He took himself down. Johnny Walker took his back, put in the rear naked choke and submitted him. So I'm telling you, man, I've seen Ayan Kutalaba drop the ball way too many times. But I am going to pick Ayan Kutalaba to win via knockout in that very first round. Oh, man. And this one's a banger of a fight, man. I'm super excited for this one, man. We have a featherweight fight kicking off the main event. This is going to be a banger, man. This is my vote for uh, fight of the night, or at least a uh, contender for fight of the night. Give me um, a featherweight fight between Bill Algio and Alexander Hernandez. Algio comes in 17-7. and seven as a minus 140 favorite. He is 34 years old, six foot with a 73 inch reach. He's fighting Alexander Hernandez. Hernandez comes in with a 14 and six record, plus 120 on the money line, 31 years old, 5'9", with a 72 inch reach. And I'm going with the underdog in this fight. And for as much as I just talked bad about Ayan Kutalaba being untrustworthy and unreliable and dropping the ball, that's Alexander Hernandez, man. So. Um, it's tough, you know, betting on a guy that I know can quit in the octagon. This guy is a proven quitter, a proven gas bagger, a, a proven guy that can't fight 15 minutes. And Bill Algio can. Bill Algio 100% needs to utilize and weaponize his cardio in this fight. And similar to, you know, Philip Linz, if he doesn't get put out, which I don't think, you know, happens uh, early in this fight by Alexander Hernandez, he should be able to look good in that second and third round and put a pace on Alexander Hernandez. The thing with me is the reason I am picking Alexander Hernandez to win this fight is, for one, this is that featherweight. This is that 145. Alexander Hernandez is a 155-er. He, he should be fighting at 155. He actually tried to fight at featherweight two fights ago against Billy Q. And similar to a lot of his fights, man, he's looking good. He's looking like money. I actually had money on Billy Q that night. And I was like, oh, no, here we go. Um, Hernandez, may, you know, maybe he should be at 145 the whole time. He's looking good against Billy Q in that first round. Uh, he's kind of working Billy Q. Sure enough, second round starts, Billy Q starts working him. And then by the end, he gets finished by Billy Q, man. Uh, just one of those guys where if he fades, man, his his, his punches are uh, slower. His defensive movement is way slower. His footwork's slower. There's less pop on his punches. And it happens fast, man. It happens right around that six minutes, seven minutes of a fight. Um... Hernandez starts to fade, and that's one of the biggest, you know, red flags that you never want to bet on a fighter that has no gas tank. He's fighting Bill Algio, Senor Perfecto, a guy that has proven to be durable, a guy that has proven to be, you know, able to put on a pace in that third round. He's coming off a finish against TJ Brown before that. He lost to Andre Feely, man. This guy's looked good. Herbert Burns, you know, probably not in the UFC anymore, but I've seen Bill Algio look good later in fights. The thing is, he's 34 years old. And I actually think that Hernandez's second attempt back down at 145 because after he lost to Billy Q, he went back up like he should have and, and got a good win against Jim, Jim Miller, who was like 5,000 years old at 145. But now all of a sudden, he is back down out of nowhere for a reason at 145. So it makes me scratch my head, but also makes me think, okay, he has to know. He has to win this fight. He is 2-3 and three in his last five fights. He is 1-2 and two in his last three fights. He cannot be losing this fight, man. And another thing about Alexander Hernandez is like, I don't like the guy. I'm honest. He's kind of annoying. Um, I don't like him on the mic. He's pretty arrogant. Uh, it was so funny to see him complain about uh, being on the prelims against Moikano. And then he got finished by Moikano. Uh, he got just dominated in that fight. He was complaining about how he should be a main card fighter on the pay-per-view. Blah, blah, blah. Gets finished in that fight. That was awesome. Had money on Moikano as well. I've actually faded Hernandez quite a bit in his UFC career. But I'm actually switching up, man. I'm going with him at 145. His second chance at this division. And I might look super dumb for picking this guy. But give me Alexander Hernandez, plus 120. I'm seeing a, pl a couple plus 125s out there. And I actually think that he's going to, I don't know if he's going to finish, but I actually think he does get a knockdown against Bill Algio. I'm going to go with a decision, which is absolutely crazy to hear and say out loud. But give me Alexander Hernandez to win via decision in what should be a banger of a fight. Up next, we have four fights left, guys. We're cruising through this one today.
And I know a lot of people are not going to like that Alexander Hernandez pick. A bunch of my friends have money on Bill Algio. But hey, man, you got to go with your gut. Always go with your gut. Always go with what you think is going to happen, man. And in this lightweight fight, I think it's going to be um, a banger for one guy. One guy is going to be doing a lot of banging in this fight, but I don't know about the other. We have Drew Dober taking on Ricky Glenn. Drew Dober comes in with a 26-12 and 12 record. Coming in as a massive minus 470 favorite, almost minus 500, unreal. He is 34 years old, 5'8", with a 70-inch reach. He is fighting Ricky Glenn. Ricky Glenn comes in with a 22-7-2 record, sitting as a massive plus 360 underdog. He is also 34 years old. He is 6 foot, I'm sorry, tall, with a 70 and a half inch reach. And I'm going with Drew Dober to knock out Ricky Glenn, man. Open and shut case, first round knockout, if not second round knockout. Um, kind of crazy, kind of a weird fight, honestly. Don't know why this fight's booked. Um, huge step down competition, in my opinion, for Drew Dober. Drew Dober's been fighting at the top of the lightweight division for a long time, man. This guy has the most, or sorry, he is tied for the most knockouts in UFC history at the lightweight division. He is tied with Dustin Poirier. No one has knocked out more people than him and Dustin Poirier. I think that he's going to be able to claim number one spot, most knockouts in the division after this fight. I think that he's going to knock out Ricky Glenn. Because Drew Dober is a durable striker, man. Both these guys are actually super durable, but we did see both these guys actually coming off knockout losses. Kind of crazy, right? Um, but the, to me, Ricky Glenn getting knocked out by Christos Giagos is a much uh, a worse look, in my opinion, than Drew Dober getting knocked out by Matt Favola. Matt Favola, Cream crack. He is proven to have power. Matt Favola, he's fighting Benoit Saint Denis here soon on a pay per view, and if he could win that fight, man, that'd be crazy. But Matt Favola can crack. That was that was a, a shocking loss because Drew Dober, man, look at this guy's chin. Um, it's insane. It's huge. It's literally huge. Um, and, but he's durable, man. This guy can take a punch, and finally, it got cracked against Matt Favola. He went down. So you gotta wonder, is that chin, you know, finally turning to dust? But on the other side, man, I'm telling you, for someone to get knocked out by Christos Diagos, that's just a terrible look. And not other than that, like more more so, he has bad striking defense, man. His hands are low sometimes. The more the fight goes, the lower his hands get. And his head movement isn't the best. I think that Drew Dober has better footwork, um, better switch stance striking, and better ability to cut off the cage here. And I think that he's going to be able to back up Ricky Glenn uh, pretty easily in this fight, put him on the warning track, and then put him out. I think it's going to happen either late in that first round or early second round. Give me Drew Dober to knock out Ricky Glenn in this fight. And up next, this is my uh, another contender for fight of the night. Drew Dober can't be fight of the night because I actually think that he's going to dominate and like, just kill that guy, uh, <laughs> Ricky Glenn. But we have a welterweight fight between Alex Morono and Joaquin Buckley, man. Morono the Great White Hope comes in 23-8, and eight, sitting as a underdog at plus 165. He is 33 years old, 5'11", with a 72-inch reach. Joaquin New Mensa Buckley comes in with a 16-6 and six record, sitting as a minus 175 favorite. On the screen right here, it says minus 200. This was shot on Monday. So you can tell already money has been coming in on Morono. So he's currently minus 170. He was minus 200 earlier in the week. Buckley coming in at 29 years old, 5'10", with a 76-inch reach. Now, straight away, I'll tell you my pick, man. I am picking Joaquin Buckley to knock out Alex Morono in this fight. Now, Alex Morono, man, I, I'm a big fan of this guy. I remember when he took a short-notice fight against uh, Cowboy Cerrone, and he won that fight. He finished Cerrone in that fight, and he actually went on a crazy good run, man. He was kind of middling, you know, kind of 500 in his UFC career, not really going anywhere, and then pulls off a crazy run. Beats Cerrone, finishes uh, Cerrone, beats Zawada, beats Mickey Gall, beats Selmsberger, comes in against Santiano uh, Pon Ponzinibbio on short notice, is winning that fight, which really sucks, man. He was winning that fight on his way to win, gets finished in that third round, that sucks. Comes back, beats a very hard opponent, big uh, big guy, very durable, veteran, smart fighter in Tim Means. That was a tough fight. Finishes him as well, submits him. Man, this guy has, has been on a run, man, ever since that Cerrone fight after that Pettis loss. And the other side, we have Buckley, where... He should never have been fighting at 185. I think the at 170, the welterweight division is his true weight class. His most recent fight, he knocked out Andre Fiala via head kick. Then before that, he got finished by uh, Chris Curtis, Asa Imavov, finished Duryev, um, beat uh, Abdul Rasak Hassan, who's actually on the next fight. So yeah, man, um, I like both guys. It's not like I don't like Alex Morono. It's just that walking Buckley to me is going to have a very significant speed advantage on the feet. And if Morono does try to wrestle here, 
I think that Buckley has the wrestling to compete with Morono. I don't know if he has a jujitsu to compete with Morono, but I think that Buckley has the defensive grappling to withstand a you know grapple fest from Morono. Uh, I will say, you know, while I was doing some research for this fight on Buckley, I was listening to a podcast where he was on. He had recently gone out to Austin, Texas to work out with the B team with uh, Craig Jones and Nicky Rod and all those guys. A really good jiu-jitsu team, man. Probably the second best in the world. That's why they call the B team. And he was just talking about his training week, how he trains for fights, what a training camp week is like. And I'm not going to lie, guys. He mentioned his grappling and jiu-jitsu schedule, and he only gets like two hours a week like of grappling at all. Total, like if you add it all up. And I was like, whoa, he only gets like two sessions in in a whole whole week. And I was like, well, that's crazy. He was definitely one of those guys that loves to practice his striking. This guy is hitting bits all the time, uh, shadow boxing, doing all this stuff. And so I was like, huge red flag. I was like, well, that's not good. But it was in the context of him in a jiu-jitsu uh, gym. Like kind of, he was there to visit working on his uh, wrestling in jiu-jitsu. So it's not like he wasn't trying. But it was kind of weird to hear him say about how he doesn't really wrestle that much in camp. Um, and that's definitely going to be an area Alex Morono, in my opinion, is going to be able to try to utilize here and take advantage of over Buckley because the more he stays on the feet, man, the more time you give Buckley to land that one shot and put you out. And like I said, at minus or at welterweight at 170, that weight pound division, I think that's his uh, true, you know, weight. I think that's where he should be fighting his true weight class. And I think that he's going to catch Morono, man. It's a small apex cage. I think that's going to play a factor. Buckley's going to be able to cut him off and and catch him, man. Um, it's not the greatest look getting finished by Ponzinibbio in that fight. I'll be honest. Um, but it was on short notice, so I'll give him that. He is 33 years old. Buckley's still 29. He has a lot of experience, man. He had a lot of amateur experience before uh, becoming pro. He turned pro in the UFC, I think, at like, 24 years old, something crazy. He's had like, 10 fights in three years. Um, this guy's very active, man. Give me Buckley. He's just the more athletic guy. He's a quick twitch. Shout out to Bill Burr. Um, give me Buckley to win via first-round knockout. I actually think I'm going to call my shot go first-round knockout in this fight. And now it's time for the co-main event. Whew, this one's going to be another uh, volatile fight. Very, very uh, violent fight, you could say. We have a middleweight fight between Joe Body Bags Pfeiffer. He is fighting Abdul Judo Thunder Rasak Al Hassan. Joe Pfeiffer comes in with a 11-2 record, currently sitting as a minus 400 favorite. So on the screen, you see right there, minus 380. And he's been getting bet even more. More, more people, you know, turning in their money to bet on Pfeiffer, pushing him all the way to minus 400. 4-1 four to favorite, 27 years old, 6'2", with a 75-inch reach. He's fighting Abdul Rasak Al-Hassan, who has a 12-5 and record, currently sitting as a plus 300 underdog. He is 38 years old, 5'10", with a 73-inch reach. Now, I want to start with Abdul Rasak Al Hassan. I don't like this guy, man. Screw this guy. This guy always costs me money. I can never get this guy's fight right. Uh, he lost to Walking Buckley when Walking Buckley had the urban survival tactical guy, that dude that does those fake videos with the cop, the fake cop guy. He was getting, Buckley was getting cornered by that guy, and Red, Abdul lost to that guy. Like, that was unforgivable. That moment, that day, he was gone from my, my, my bankroll. I will never bet on him again. I was shocked. But he actually got, got out-wrestled in that fight. It's actually crazy because his nickname is Judo Thunder. He is a black belt in Judo. He's from Ghana. This dude is yoked, man. His thighs are enormous. This dude is huge. Uh, very powerful guy. Super uh, short and stocky guy. Um, He's 5'10", fighting at 185, guys. This guy is a brick house. But it's weird. He doesn't really use his Judo throws or, or trips really all that often in the UFC. He's just a powerful striker. This guy's a killer. I believe he has 11 first-round knockouts. Um, something crazy like that. His finish rate on his wins are it's almost like a hundred percent. This guy is finishing his fights, and there it goes. Like that's my main point. If he if he doesn't win in that first round, if he doesn't knock you out in that first round, he is gonna lose in that second or third round. Joe Pfeiffer, you know, twenty seven years old, six two prospect coming in at minus four hundred. I don't know, man, because it's not like it's out of the question that Abdul can't catch Joe Pfeiffer. Joe Pfeiffer, yes, very good striker, very long striker, and. He's supposed to be this super good prospect, and I, I, I get it. He has very good jiu-jitsu. He has a very good gym he's coming out of out there in Philly. Trains with guys like Sean Brady, and he's very good um, ever since that contender series fight. He looked good. Uh, he went viral for Dana White, you know, saying, be like Joe Pfeiffer when you come on a contender series as a fight like him. Um, he kind of just whipped his dude ass. Ozzy Diaz, he looked good in that fight. And then didn't look that good at all against Alan Amadovsky. And then Gerald Mershart, man. So Amadovsky and Mershart, like, those aren't that good of wins, in my opinion. And all I can think about in this fight is if Abdul gets taken down, he's done. He's going to lose. His energy is going to be gone. When he gets up, he's not going to have that much power at all anymore. 
So he can't get taken down. If Joe Fiverr decides to go in there and take down Abdul in that first round, he'll be fine. He'll, he'll get, let him up, and then second round, he'll probably finish him uh, when Abdul is really tired. But if Joe Fiverr gets into a slug, slang, like a slug fest here, you know, slang and bang with Abdul, he can get caught, man. I worry about um, a scenario where Joe Pfeiffer has Abdul, Rasak, Al-Hassan on the cage, the warning track, and Abdul is kind of shelling up, kind of doing what Izzy Adesanya did against um, Pereira, and then just cracks one. Like, all it really takes is one wrong decision from Joe Pfeiffer to dip when he shouldn't, to zag when he shouldn't, to just make one mistake. And he gets clubbed by Abdul Razak al -Hassan. He is not getting up, guys. This guy has crazy, crazy power. So, yeah, it's, it, like, Joe Pfeiffer could be whooping on Abdul Razak al -Hassan and I don't know where he get knocked out. And so, man, at minus 400, no shot. I do think he's going to win this fight. I do think that he finishes Abdul Razak al -Hassan. I just think that Joe Fiverr has too many paths to victory, or not too many, just more, I should say, than Abdul. Abdul's only way to win, in my opinion, is to win via knockout. Man, at plus 300, that's, that's crazy, man. Uh, that's, that's crazy. I'll be honest. Uh, we, I don't think we've seen enough from Joe Fiverr to, to warrant a minus 400 favor over guy with 10 first-round knockouts in Abdul al Razak Hassan. So give me Joe Fiverr. I'm going to go with second-round finish. He's probably going to finish Abdul when Abdul... You know, shows his cardio, shows his lack of cardio, I should say, and and fades in that fight. So, once Joe Pfeiffer survives that first round, he'll be safe. Give me Joe Pfeiffer, second round, ground and pound finish. And now it's time for the main event, guys. Do me a favor, let me know what you think about the video so far. What do you think about my my warmer right here, and what do you think about my pick? So I'm gonna take one more sip, and we'll get into the main event. We have a five round lightweight fight between Grant Dawson and Bobby King Green. Grant Dawson comes in with a 21 and 1 record, currently sitting as a minus 395 favorite. He is 29 years old, 5'10 with a 72 inch reach. And Bobby Green comes in with a 30, 14 and 1 crazy experience, coming in as a plus 280 underdog. He is 37 years old, 5'10 with a 71 inch reach. Now, I remember finding out this fight got booked. I remember where I was at the gym, and I get the update. You know, Grant Dawson booked for a main event with Bobby Green. And I was like, all right, cool. You know, good for them. This is definitely a good spot for Grant Dawson. I get it. I get what they're doing with Bobby Green. And in my head, I was like, okay, Grant Dawson's going to be like minus 250, minus 300. I expected him to be a big favorite. The line comes out and he's minus 400. I was like, what the hell? What are we, what's, what? What are we doing? What's going on? That's so annoying, dude. But yeah, Grant Dawson is going to finish Bobby Green. He's going to take his back and pound him out. Um, Bobby Green's 37 years old, guys. He's 11 and 9 in the UFC. And he has good defensive wrestling. I'll give him that. He has very good hips. But his get-ups, I'll be honest, aren't the best. And he can get controlled. And it's kind of tough saying that because we haven't really seen that recently other than Islam Makhachev, who's literally the current champion right now. But, I mean, I rate Grant Dawson's wrestling very highly. I rate, I rate, I rate it like up there with the top five guys in the UFC. His back takes are incredible. His body locks are really good. Once he gets a body triangle on you, he's like Algerman Sterling. The round's over pretty much. Um, so it's just one of those fights where... This might just take three takedowns from Grant Dawson and he might win the fight. Whether he finishes Bobby Green or not, he's going to bank three rounds right there. And Bobby Green is going to lose, or he can win the next two and not win the fight. I got to bring up the Grant Dawson's cardio. And that's where it gets tricky here because this is a five-round fight. And we have seen Grant Dawson look tired in three-round fights. So if you're in there tired, I mean, ask Rafael Fizio about what's it like to be tired in front of Bobby Green. It sucks. You're going to be running around, running away, literally running away. For that entire third, fourth, and fifth round. If he does get tired. Um, I believe it was the the Glenn fight where he just he just dumped. It was crazy. He ended up switching camps later on in his UFC career. He's only fought two camps or two fights with his new gym, American Top Team, which is like the one of the best American gyms in the world. You know, guys got like Poirier and guys like that, Colby's old gym. Um, those guys are killers. One of the some of the best coaches, some of the best facilities at American Top Team. It's also like a premier gym, right? So he was with Kraus. Um, out in Kansas City, small gym. Um, he was a big fish in the small gym. Goes to the American Top Team. Now he has all these training partners, right? Um, and he's looked good. The cardio issue, I'll, I'll give him that, has not like shown up the last two fights against Mark Madsen and against Demiris Magulov. Um, but man, he's hittable. Uh, his striking isn't very good. 
And it's not even close to, uh, to good as Bobby Green. Now, I was actually at Bobby Green's last fight against Tony Ferguson, and I'll be honest, he didn't look that good at all either. Um, he's been doing some weird stuff with eye pokes and headbutts um, in his last two fights. I don't want to say he's dirty or anything, but it's just kind of weird that in his last two most previous fights, uh, a lot of fouls were happening. So I don't know what's up with that. Before that, last two in a row, you know, got finished by Drew Dober, got absolutely slept by Drew Dober with the hook, and then got dominated by Islam Makhachev so bad that he accused him of using steroids after the fight. Grant Dawson, I just think that he's too good of a wrestler to not finish Bobby Green. I think that he's going to take his back, dominate him, um, either boom and mount or submit this guy. I don't know if it's going to be a submission or ground pound finish. I do lean ground and pound finish, but Bobby Green is very smart. He's a veteran, man. This guy knows when he's getting beat up on the mat, he, he needs to move. He knows how to not lose fights. He knows how to not lose positions. Um, but yeah, I just don't think it's going to matter. I think Grant Dawson, we're going to see another level up here. Everybody's going to be parlaying him. On the screen, it says minus 395, but he's already in minus 400 area. Um, everyone's going to be putting him in his parlay. And this should you know, ultimately be a coming out party for Grant Dawson in this fight. I'm going to go with a second round or third round ground and pound finish. I believe that he will finish his fight before that fourth round. I don't think that we see the championship rounds. Bobby Green, 37 years old, almost a 500 fight in the UFC. I've seen that they have two different levels of grappling. And yeah, man, I think Bobby Green gets finished in this fight. So give me Grant Dawson to really put a stamp on his career here. Level up. Call somebody out um, on the mic to win via second or third round ground and pound finish. And so that'll do it, guys. That's the whole card, man. Really quickly, I'll go through my picks up and down from up. We're going with Montella De La Rosa. This fight got canceled, so we'll skip that one. Murata. We're going with Kanaka Murata. We're going with Matuas Mendoka. We're going with Diana Belbitsa, underdog right there. We're going with Ion Kuntalaba. We're going with Alexander Hernandez, underdog again. We're going with Drew Dober. We're going with Joaquin Buckley. We're going with Joe Pfeiffer and Grant Dawson, guys. So that'll be it, guys. 10 fights. Broke them all down. Thank you so much for watching. Bet on Texas. Bet on Texas. They're going to cover against Oklahoma. They're going to kill them. Who else? Bet on Georgia. Kentucky under... Man, if you like college football, if you like stuff like that, hit me up on Instagram. I'm always gambling. I'm always betting. There's any action sports cast, guys. I will bet on any sport. It's a great time of the year, man. We have college football, NFL. Hockey is about to start. Basketball is about to start. We have the UFC. We have playoff baseball. Maybe, like This is the best time of the year. I love MLB, man. That's my sport. Baseball is like my true first true love. But yeah, guys, thank you so much for watching, man. Leave me a comment. Let me know what you think about my picks. And I'll see you guys next week. Peace.